this week, we will continue the story of the history of silk on Centurions, where all we feature are man-made things that have lasted over 100 years or more. I'm Dimitri, and let's continue this story. In the same manner that one would sometimes estimate the price of products according to a certain weight of gold, a length of silk cloth became a monetary standard in China, in addition to bronze coins. Many neighboring countries began to grow envious of the wealth that sericulture provided China, and beginning in the 2nd century BC, the Xiongu people regularly pillaged the provinces of the Han Chinese for around 250 years. Silk was a common offering by the emperor to these tribes in exchange for peace. The military payrolls tell us that soldiers were paid in bundles of plain silk textiles which circulated as currency in the Han times. Soldiers may well have traded their silk with the nomads who came to the gates of the Great Wall to sell horses and furs. For more than a millennium, silk remained the principal diplomatic gift of the Emperor of China to neighboring countries or vassal states. The use of silk became so important that the character for silk soon constituted one of the principal radicals of the Chinese script. As a material for clothing and accessories, the use of silk was regulated by a very precise code in China. For example, the Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty used color symbolism to denote the various ranks of bureaucrats, according to their function in society, with certain colors of silk restricted to the upper classes only. Under the Ming Dynasty, silk began to be used in a series of accessories like handkerchiefs, wallets, belts, or even as an embroidered piece of fabric displaying dozens of animals, real or mythical. These fashion accessories remained associated with a particular position. There was specific headgear for warriors, for judges, for nobles, and others for religious use. The women of high Chinese society also followed these codified practices and used silk in their garments alongside the addition of countless decorative motifs. A 17th century work from Jinping Mei gives a description of one such motif. Silk was made using various breeds of Lepidopterans, both wild and domestic. While wild silks were produced in many countries, the Chinese are considered to have been the first to produce silk fabric on a large scale, having the most efficient species of silk moth for silk production, the Bomex mandarina and its domesticated descendant, the Bomex mori. Chinese sources claim the existence in 1090 of a machine to unwind silkworm cocoons the cocoons were placed in a large basin of hot water. The silk would leave the cauldron by tiny guiding rings and would be wound onto a large spool, using a backward and forward motion. However, little information exists about the spinning techniques previously used in China. The spinning wheel, in all likelihood moved by hand, was known to exist by the beginning of the Christian era. The first accepted image of a spinning wheel appears in 1210 with an image of a silk spinning machine powered by a water wheel that dates to 1313. Numerous archaeological discoveries show that silk had become a luxury material appreciated in foreign countries well before the opening of the Silk Road by the Chinese. 
For example, silk has been found in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, in the tomb of a mummy dating to 1070 BC. Both the Greeks and the Romans speak of a people known as Ceres, translated people of silk, a term used for the inhabitants of Serica, their name for the far-off kingdom of China. According to certain historians, the first Roman contact with silk was that of the legions of the governor of Syria, Crassus. At the Battle of Cahe, near the Euphrates, the legions were said to be so surprised by the brilliance of the banners of Parthia that they fled. The Silk Road toward the west was opened by the Chinese in the 2nd century AD. The main road left from Xi'an, going either to the north or south of the Taklamakan Desert, one of the most arid in the world, before crossing the Pamir Mountains. The caravans that traveled this route to exchange silk with other merchants were generally sizable, constituting 100 to 500 people as well as camels and yaks carrying around 140 kilograms of merchandise. The route linked to Antioch and the coast of the Mediterranean, about one year's travel from Xi'an. In the south, a second route went by Yemen, Burma and India before rejoining the northern route. Not long after the conquest of Egypt in 30 BC, regular commerce began between the Romans and Asia, marked by Roman appetite for silk cloth coming from the Far East, which was then resold to the Romans by the Parthians. The Roman Senate tried in vain to prohibit the wearing of silk for economic reasons as well as moral ones. The import of Chinese silk resulted in vast amounts of gold leaving Rome, to such an extent that silk clothing was perceived as a sign of decadence and immorality. China traded silk, teas and porcelain, while India traded spices, ivory, textiles, precious stones and pepper and the Roman Empire exported gold, silver, fine glassware, wine, carpets, and jewels. Although the term, the Silk Road, implies a continuous journey, very few who traveled the route transversed it from end to end. For the most part, goods were transported by a series of agents on varying routes. The main traders during antiquity were the Indian and Bactrian traders, followed by Sogdian traders from the 5th to the 8th century AD, and then followed by Arab and Persian traders. In the late Middle Ages, transcontinental trade over the land routes of the Silk Road declined as sea trade increased. Centuries went by. Civilizations and dynasties were formed, prospered, or perished, but the route that linked the continents of Europe and Asia survived and expanded, becoming known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a significant factor in the development of the civilizations of China, India, ancient Egypt, Persia, Arabia, and ancient Rome. Though silk was certainly the major trade item from China, many other goods were traded and various technologies, religions and philosophies as well as the bubonic plague, known also as the Black Death, also traveled along the silk routes. Some of the other goods traded included luxuries such as silk, satin, hem, musk, perfumes, spices, medicines, 
jewels, glassware, and even rubber, as well as slaves. Although silk was well known in Europe and most of Asia, China was able to keep a near monopoly on silk production for several centuries. Defended by an imperial decree and condemning to death anyone attempting to export silkworm or their eggs. According to the Nihongi, sericulture reached Japan for the first time around 300 AD, following a number of international students having been sent from Japan to China, recruiting four young Chinese girls to teach the art of plain and figured weaving in Japan. Techniques of sericulture were subsequently introduced to Japan on a larger scale by frequent diplomatic exchanges between the 8th and 9th centuries. Starting in the 4th century BC, silk began to reach the Hellenistic world by merchants who would exchange it for gold, ivory, horses or precious stones. Up to the frontiers of the Roman Empire, silk became a monetary standard for estimating the value of different products. Hellenistic Greece appreciated the high quality of the Chinese goods and made efforts to plant mulberry trees and breed silkworms in the Mediterranean basin. While Sassanid Persia controlled the trade of silk destined for Europe and Byzantium. According to a story by Procopius, it was not until 552 AD that the Byzantine Emperor Justinian obtained the first silkworm eggs. He had sent two Nestorian monks to Central Asia and they were able to smuggle silkworm eggs to him, hidden in rods of bamboo. While under the monk's care, the eggs hatched though they did not cocoon before arrival. The Arabs, with their widening conquests, spread sericulture across the shores of the Mediterranean, leading to the development of sericulture in North Africa, Andalusia, Sicily and southern Italy's Calabria, which was under the Byzantine dominion. Around 1050, the theme of Calabria had cultivated 24,000 mulberry trees for their foliage, with growth still ongoing. The interactions among Byzantine and Muslim silk weaving centers of all levels of quality with imitations made in Andalusia and Lucca, among other cities. Catanzaro in the region of Calabria was the first center to introduce silk production to Italy between the 9th and the 11th century. During the following centuries, the silk of Catanzaro supplied almost all of Europe and was sold in a large market fair in the port of Reggio Calabria to Spanish, Venetian, Genoese, Florentine and Dutch merchants. Catanzaro became the lace capital of Europe with a large silkworm breeding facility that produced all the laces and linens used in the Vatican. While the cultivation of mulberry was moving first steps in northern Italy, silk made in Calabria reached a peak of 50% of the whole Italian-European production. As the cultivation of mulberry was difficult in North and Continental Europe, merchants and operators used to purchase raw materials in Calabria in order to finish the products before reselling them for a higher price. Genoese silk artisans also used fine Calabrian and Sicilian silk for the production of velvets. This is as much as we can take on this second installment of the History of Silk Centurions. My name is Dimitri. Please like, subscribe and share. Thank you for watching and bye for now.